Thank you. Thank you. Well, good day, everyone. Should be. How was that? Nope. How was that? Nope. Yeah. Testing one, two, three. That's better, isn't it? Do you want the handheld mic? How was that? Technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, terrific. Okay, we're going to try again. Good day, everyone. My, my name is Andrew Goff, and I've got the great pleasure to speak to you about what I believe to be the real lost tradition. Imagine, if you will, that the most important, the most sacred, the most deified creature that ever has been is the size of your fingernail. Imagine that. It's my, it's my hope over the next 60, 90 minutes or so to, to impress upon you my conviction that that is in fact the case and that that creature is, it is the bee, specifically the honey bee. Within the species of honey bee, we're also gonna talk quite a lot about the queen bee, because the queen bee is the foundation for the matriarchal society that was so important to the ancients, but also, I believe, to the mother goddess. I think the queen bee was the genesis of mother goddess worship. Bees are dying, but there is no mystery why they're dying. At the end of this presentation, I'll tell you why they're dying. But there is a conspiracy and there is a cover-up. Bees are a multi-billion dollar industry. If the bees were to perish, the economy would be decimated. But I'm, I'm here to tell you there's a much potential greater loss than the economic hit if the bees were to perish. And that is the hit, that is a lost tradition that's been the most contiguous sacred tradition that's ever been. So that, that's quite a, quite a statement. And to begin to understand what tradition that is and why it's been lost, we're gonna have to delve deep into the mist of prehistory. Bees over a hundred million years have been found petrified in amber as if immortalized in their own honey. And that alone has made them special amongst the ancients. Amber in the time of the Egyptians was almost as valuable as gold. And in fact, the Greeks had a word for, it, for amber called electron and meant the awakener. So the combination of that symbolism with the regenerative symbolism of the bee made the diminutive ins insect very, very special from a very, very early epoch. Honey hunting is perhaps the most fundamental, fundamental hunter-gatherer activity. Here you can see 15,000 years ago on a cave wall in Spain near Valencia, man risking life and limb to get his hands on honey. And then you see the same thing just 15 months ago in a BBC special in Nepal. Why is there this great quest for the bee and its byproducts? Well, the reason is all that the bee provides, honey with its medicinal, nutritional, ritualistic, uh, embalmment, mummification, all the purposes for honey 
They just go on and on. It was the most important ingredient in the ancient world. We have acupuncture. The Chinese used the bee's stinger, 3000 BC, for acupuncture. In fact, recently, the Chinese tried to replace the role of the bee with humans for, po for pollinating. And they found that it took 26 humans to do the job of two bees. The other sort of popular uses of the byproducts of bee include, include wax. The Catholic Church still uses and demands beeswax in its candles. Propolis, which is a special kind of honey that's used to, in medicinal purposes, strengthen the immune system. And, and lastly, as role models, there is no other living creature that has inspired man like the honeybee. And that may sound a bit ridiculous, but we'll look at that in great detail. So the reason why this, what I call tradition, has been lost is that much of what we know about the tradition has been represented in a very stylized fashion. All these images here, scholars have told us, are honeybees. You see the two sort of tall figures laden in, in, in orange. Those are mother goddess figures, scholars tell us, laden in honey, which is a sign of royalty and sacredness. But you also see stick figures, and I think more interestingly, dancing figures. And the reason why you see the dancing figures is that the ancients knew that the, the honeybee was the only insect that communicated via dance. So the bee would go up to five kilometers away from the hive, come back with the food, and dance for the rest of the hive, and they would say, cheers, thank you for that satellite navigation. I now know where to go get that food. Plato wrote about this. The ancients didn't have sky television. They were very much in tune with the ancient world. They knew about things like the bee's ability to communicate via dance, and that's why they represented it in such a stylized fashion. Here we see some examples of dancing bee goddesses. The reason why the bee is thought of as a god or goddess in the first place, again, is because its basic attributes were so valued by society that it became deified. These are dancing goddesses, according to scholars. And the first giveaway are these, these skirts or dresses with the horizontal stripes. That's usually a pretty good indication in the ancient world that we're talking about a bee. A honeybee has an abdomen, seven layers, alternating yellow and black. And it's amazing how often you see that portrayed in the ancient world. Here we see another example, and we'll talk about this a lot. I'll tell you why there's a fish on this woman's dress, because that's esoterically, symbolically significant, and why her arms are outstretched. That position is extremely important. It's not just because she embodies a dancing bee goddess. It has to do with something else. Marjorie Gambutas. Here we can see beehives in Western Australia about 7,000 BC. So why do you have a representation of a hive in your most sacred temple? Eva Crane, who we owe so much to, the, the British beekeeping expert who passed away just a few years ago, shows us this image and also reminds us that honey hunting was huge by the aboriginals. They used to carve pictures of it on the back of tree bark, and there's an ancient printer that shows aboriginals running with sacks of honey on their shoulders. Eva Crane. And no, this is not the same image. image. This is a different image. This is Cattle Hewick, one of the most famous Neolithic settlements ever. And what do we see on the wall of its sacred temple? A honeycomb. Curiously, just down the corridor, if you will, we have this famous representation of a temple of bulls. Bulls and bees are intrinsically linked, and we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail. But again, it's the shape of the bullhorns I want you to pay special attention to because 
they are very esoterically significant. And it doesn't surprise me that we see bull symbolism in the same place we see bee symbolism. But also a cattle hero can break down the corridor from this representation is something nobody talks about. And that is, I feel, the first representation of a halo in history. A halo that is comprised of bees. James Mellard, who excavated Kettle Hewitt. There is no greater golden age for the veneration of the honeybee than dynastic Egypt. The Sumerians were the first. They were the first at so much to leverage all aspects of the bee and its byproducts. But we'll talk about the Sumerians when we look at the genesis of organized religion. So, once again, Eva Crane tells us that the honeybee migrated into Egypt from lands that we know also deified the bee, the Levant. The Zargos Mountains, where Egyptologist David Roll says that's where the biblical Eden is. And we know from the Bible that there were bees in the biblical Eden, so it all kind of fits together. But what we see here is a classic drawing from the uh, eastern Egyptian desert. And you see a boat with a figure with their arms above their head and what appears to be a box, a chest, an altar. I'm here to tell you that is a beehive. That is a beehive. The ancient world revolved around the economy of honey and particularly, as we'll see, drugs opium, heroin, and morphine. The genesis of the, of the bee kings, this fascinates me because nobody talks about this. We have the whole land around Cairo, the delta. What's it called? Tabidi. What does that mean? Land of the bee. What's the pharaoh's title? Beekeeper. Always has been since 3000 BC first dynasty, first king. There's always been offices in the king's administration. In the old kingdom, it was sealer of the honey and overseer of the beekeepers by the middle kingdom. And a bee has always appeared in the king's cartouche. And why not? He or she has always been the beekeeper. Here you can see the cartouche of Hashaput. So this is a picture of the eastern Egyptian desert. So it's Luxor, then east, and all that's there today are abandoned wadis of what remains rock art. I had the, the very good fortune of traveling through the eastern desert with each biologist, Tony Wilkinson and David Roll, and it's a fascinating place. This is the god of the Egyptian eastern desert, the god Min. The pyramid text tell us he's a master of the wild bees. Well, that's not surprising. He's depicted in feathers, wings, plumes, and an erect penis, the best sign of regenerative symbolism. This is the sort of image that you see on the rock reliefs in the eastern Egyptian desert, these gods with these really tall plumes. Keep in mind, and they're always in boats, and they always have their arms raised up over their heads. This is where the ancestors, whoever they were, were would have traveled to have gotten in to the, the, the Nile Valley, the, the Nakata sort of foundation of the Egyptian dynastic community. What we find, and what Winkler and Weigel, two Egyptologists in the early part of the last century, discovered is that there's nothing but boats carved with these figures with their arms over their head, and these boxes and these altars. Well, these aren't boxes or altars or chests. These are beehives. Beehives are being dragged across the wadis into the Nile Valley. Joseph Garfunkel, the uh, 
Biblical archaeologist tells us that in the Near East, there's always been a high percentage of figures of women who are portrayed dancing. But in Egypt, that figure is over 80%. This is a picture of a site that I discovered that's chronicled in the Eastern Desert Survey. And once again, it shows a dancing goddess with her arms over her head. The arms over her head is very significant. It's not just because she's a dancing goddess. There is another reason. It's kind of like the Red Mini syndrome. Once you see a Red Mini on the road, you see a dozen of them in the next hour. Once you realize that beast symbolism is everywhere in Egypt, you can't help but see it on all the pillars and all the walls, such as here in Luxor. Classic examples of Egyptian tombs, just ordinary scenes of beekeeping, reinforcing the fact that this is extremely important to their culture on all levels. Here's an 18th dynasty tomb. Here's a, a 5th dynasty tomb, and this is where the, the, the phrase blowing smoke comes from. But bee symbolism in Egypt is also quite, quite mysterious. And, and this is just a good example here. Here we have a picture from Dendera. And Here's a picture of a man or a woman we can't tell smoking some apparent tobacco or drug. I'll come back to this, but I submit to you that this is an opium drug that comes from Crete and honey is used to sweeten it. And Dendera inscription talks about how Osiris emulated the bee and the other world, a domain that contained the tree of golden apples of immortality. When I, when I heard that, it reminded me of this relief from the palace of Kenosis in Crete, which I visited just a couple months ago, and the legend of Hades, the underworld, heaven and hell which also talks about a single tree or a grove of trees bearing immortality, giving golden apples. The bee was the first most important ideogram at Tanis. The Temple of Tanis is where they supposedly kept the Ark of the Covenant. We'll see, astonishingly enough, that the bee is actually tied and related to the Ark of the Covenant. The bee is also found on the Rosetta Stone. Again, just a little bit of color as to how the bee was, was perceived in ancient Egypt. Here's, here's the opening of the mouth ritual where it says, the bee giving him protection, they make him to exist. Going about as a bee, thou seest all the goings on about thy father. So you can see it has a, a very, very mystic association in Egyptian ritual. Beeswax, that's not a, a pharaoh in the upper right, that's Michael Jackson's wax effigy. But wax effigies go back thousands of years. And here's an example from the great beekeeping expert, Hilda Ransom, where a man caught his wife cheating on him and made a, a crocodile effigy out of beeswax that came alive and attacked her lover. Alexander the Great is said to have been buried wrapped in honey. And Herodotus tells us that that was a really common technique in the ancient world. The most important god in the entire pantheon of gods is Ra. And what do we know about Ra? Ra cried bees for tears. How about his mother? Ra's mother, the goddess Neith, she lived in a place called Sais in the western Egyptian desert. And this is interesting because she lived in a place called the house of the bee. Herodotus tells us that the gateway to the temple 
was an astonishing work, far surpassing all other buildings of the same kind in both extent and height, and built with stones of rare size and excellency. We know from Robert Graves that Plato identified the goddess Neith with Athena, who's a renowned bee goddess. The entrance to Neith's temple had a very peculiar riddle. It said, I am all that has been, that is, that will be. No mortal has yet been able to lift the veil that covers me. Well, what might that allude to? Neith was known as the veiled goddess. Bees are often called hymenoptera, meaning hymen, or the sacred part of a holy temple, or the reproductive organ of a woman. Only, only later did the veiled goddess become associated with Isis. So, what do we have around the house of the bee? Well, right behind the house of the bee is the mansion of the bee where Osiris is buried. And Osiris, what are his symbols? The beehive and the bull. We're going to talk a lot about the symbolism of bulls because they're, they're, as I said before, intrinsically tied to bees. I want to talk for a moment just about Sais, though, because this is where we learn everything that we know about Atlantis. This is where the Greek lawgiver Solon travels to talk to the high priest, and they tell him about this fantastic civilization 9,000 years ago that has perished. 300 years later, a philosopher named Crantor says, that ah, sounds too fantastical to me. I'm going to go check it out for myself, and he does, and he comes back and says, you know what? They were right. How, how many of you have been to Egypt? Raise your hand. Fantastic. H have you ever seen a temple wall, the outside or the inside of the wall, that was anything other than the Pharaoh smiting his enemy, dragging him by the hair to prison? High testosterone stuff. I've never seen a temple wall giving praise to another great race. I really don't buy the fact that Atlantis was 9,000 years ago, especially when these priests talked in lunar years. So a year is a month, and 9,000 years would be about 1100 BC. And that's exactly the time when the greatest earthquake, natural disaster in the ancient world ever took place, and that would be Thera. So we're going to talk a bit about Atlantis as well. I just think. The only thing that would make sense for those pillars to recount somebody that they felt an association with would, would, it be, would be somebody who's relatively contemporous with them. The Minoans were. Sais was 400 years after the earthquake that destroyed Thera. So what do these two cultures have in common? Veneration of bees and venerations of bulls. And those are both things we're told occurred on Atlantis. So let's talk a bit about bulls. The apis bull. Apis is Latin for bee. Bee spelled backwards is sepa, and that is our first clue about the bull. The great shepherd in the sky. Hmm. Taurus is Latin for bull. Apis is the sort of species of the honeybee. Interesting. The Apis bull was the embodiment of many of the great Egyptian gods that lived in Tabiti, the land of the bee. Herodotus tells us that it just wasn't any bull that was important, or it could be an Apis. It had to be a black bull with certain sort of configurations on its forehead. Well, that's interesting because what do we see in the sky but a bull with the exact configuration on its forehead? We have the cult of the god Apis, which dates to the First Dynasty, but possibly much earlier because Taurus, the constellation, has risen by 4500 BC. Like the Apis bull, the constellation again has this distinctive triangle, and we'll come back to that. The seven tiered step pyramid of Saqqara 
is very famous indeed. And nearby is something called the Serapium, which is an underground bull necropolis that Marietta discovered in 1851 when he noticed that there were bull horns protruding above the sand. We know from a philosopher in 250 BC that in Egypt, if you bury an ox in certain places so that only his horns project above ground and then saw them off, they say that bees fly out for the ox purifies and is resolved in the bees. Specifically, 1,000 bees are generated out of the carcass of a bull. Mithraism, we are told, is the Roman mystery cult of sacrificing a bull. Nobody knows too much about it, but I argue that the genesis of Mithraism wasn't a Roman invention, it was an Egyptian invention, if not earlier, and perhaps the Serapium was one of the first Mithra temples. And here we can see a classic Roman Mithra temple. There's one in London, but it's buried under an apartment complex, and they're trying to restore it. So here's an example of a bull being slaughtered. This memory of slaughtering a big animal and having bees come forth out of it is preserved in really peculiar ways. And one example is Lyle's Golden Syrup where we have bees coming out of a lion. Now that immediately reminds us of the biblical le legend of, of Samson in the book of Judges where he, he, he wrestles and kills a lion and notice that bees are coming out of its, of its carcass. And it gives rise to this riddle, the answer of which is, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? So interesting that the memory appears to have been preserved Amazingly, many Spanish bull rings are built over Mithra's temple. So this ritual of slaughtering a bull for purposes, apparently, of generating bees, and we'll find out the bees supposedly become souls in the constellation of Orion. This continues today with bullfighting. I just went to a bullfight in Madrid a couple months ago, painful to watch, and let me tell you, the bull was far mightier than the matador. For a bull,
not be a reference to the bee. The jet killer is all about stability and regeneration. You see it in Abydos, Dendera. It's depicted in Zakara, ceremonies at Hepset Festival of regeneration. It has that kind of symbolism. And it's always being placed up to the Pharaoh's mouth. What is it? Nobody knows. Conventional wisdom is, because it's associated with Osiris, and Osiris is associated with the bull, then it must be the bull's spine. It's the backbone of Osiris, the jet killer is. That's interesting, I kind of like that. But let's take it a bit further. Why could it not be a symbolic honeymoon? It's always being put up to the mouth of the bee king in ceremonies Was the Sphinx a bee goddess? And you're probably smirking right now, and I don't blame you, but stay, but stay with me on this one. The, uh, the Sphinx was known as Hunab, to strangle, or the strangler. It wasn't until the Greeks came in and renamed it Sphinx. Well, the Greeks learned everything they know about beekeeping from the Minoans. The Minoans had a word for B that was S-P-H-E-X. Now, also bear with me on this one because we're going to build upon this, and, and that is the pyramid texts tell us there are two dogs that guard the goddess, that guard the sphinx. Where are they? Many believe the Sphinx portrays the dog Anubis, and curiously, the vital force of his skin is frequently represented by bees. He's the god of the necropolis, and he's related and predates, actually, Osiris. But here we have Hakata and Artemis protecting a bee goddess. So this notion of two dogs or two griffins or two lions protecting a bee goddess goes right the way through history. We'll look at more examples of it. And let's perhaps for now not draw any conclusions about whether the Sphinx was a bee goddess. So many other ancient cultures kept the tradition of bee veneration alive, not because they thought it was sacred, but because they realized, like their predecessors, predecessors, if they leveraged the bee and all its byproducts, their civilization would flourish. If it didn't, they would perish. So the, the bee deities evolved. Sybil, the ancient mother goddess of Anatolia, was the goddess of bees and caves. And this is where the concept of Sybil comes from, a high priestess, a female who's a seer. And this is a, a picture I took from a museum in Germany, a 15th century Sybil. So this tradition has gone right on until the present. In Bulgaria, there's a huge society or cult of bee goddesses. It's still prevalent the world over. The Hittites were one of the earliest sort of users of the bee and all its products, and they had huge fines if anybody were to steal a hive. And this is actually where the word Melissa comes from, which is one of the, the more modern terms for bee goddess. It means honey in uh, the Hittite language. Bee veneration in Sicily and Rhodes, here we have a bee sphinx with wings. Bees appear on coins in all ancient cultures. But like Egypt, there, it's hard to exceed the bee veneration that takes place on Crete. And we're going to go deep into Crete because this is really peculiar. In Crete, we're told by Marjorie Cavutis again that the hieroglyphs of their language, linear A, we haven't deciphered what that means yet. We can't read it. Linear B, we can. But they actually use beehives. And Ransom adds that when you combine the hieroglyphs, they're actually talking about royalty. So just like the Egyptians, who always had a beehive in the cartouche of the pharaoh, so did the Minoans. 
We can see that it was referred to as the mistress, but also the pure mother bee at this time. Again, scholars tell us that this is a bee goddess protected by two griffins. There's always two griffins, dogs or lions, protecting the bee goddess. And those horns are not what we think they are. Yes, they're bull horns, but what do they really mean? Crete is where the gods were born. This is where Rhea gave birth to Zeus in this cave. I visited it a couple, couple of months ago and took these pictures just to give you a feel for where Zeus was raised. This is a different cave, both of which were sacred to the Minoans, and this is the cave where Zeus was raised after he was born and fed honey by 50 nymphs. But the most famous place in all of Crete is Kenosis, and this palace is just laden in bee symbolism. It's called the Palace of the Double Axe, and we'll, we'll talk about that because a double axe is not an axe. Arthur Evans excavated Crete, I'm um, sorry, Kenosis. Here you can see me with the, uh, the horns of consecration, which appear to be bull horns. This is where Icarus had his great falls. He went too close to the sun with his beeswax wings. We have the great bull fresco. We have that fresco I talked about earlier, the dancing goddesses and the grove of trees above them, not pictured in this image. We have a coin with a labyrinth on it. I'm here to tell you there was no labyrinth. How many people have been to Hawara in Egypt? Hawara is where Herodotus went and said, unbelievable, this is greater than the pyramid. This is greater than the Great Pyramid of Giza. This labyrinth is amazing. Well, it was, Hawara was an administrative center. Imagine walking from a village and poverty into luxury and the most incredible skyline of office buildings you've ever seen in your life. That was Hawara. That's what Kenosis was. It was an amazing, amazing palace. There is no labyrinth. L-A-B-R-Y-S, where labyrinth comes from, means double axe. And the double axe is not an axe. I do believe in labyrinths, the one on the floor of Shard Cathedral. I've walked every British turf maze, ancient turf mazes with that same design. There's something going on with that shape. There's something that adjusts the mind and makes it more receptive to certain sort of spiritual or, or um, call it what you want sort of thinking. I believe in that, but I don't believe in a labyrinth with a bull in kenosis. You have these great, great big jars, and kenosis, like the other palaces in Crete, or either right on the ocean or on a river that leads to the ocean. So they were the world's greatest seafarers. Nobody could touch them. And they had loads of money. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? This is um, dancing goddesses in the, uh, the queen's chamber in the palace of Kenosis. And nobody seems to really talk much about the fact they have bees in their hair. This is the bull leaping sort of um, field next to the palace. And the bull leaping sort of looks like this. I don't, again, believe that bull leaping was a real activity uh, where uh, uh, a young man would show his athleticism by, by jumping over and doing certain aerobics over a, a, a charging bull. I, I think, you know, an, earlier version of this is found in Avaris in Egypt where, where the exodus started from and also in northern Syria. I believe it's more of an allegorical representation of a king's hebsed, a, a revival of their, their rule. I don't believe they physically did this. Even though you find it today, people actually do this today. This image is a very, very famous image, and it's a subject of, of much research in mind. I'm going to pass over it because I share that research with another researcher, and, it'd be, and it's just not ready yet. But maybe next time, next year, I could, I could 
do a whole presentation on that fresco. So the horns of consecration are everywhere on Crete and everywhere in Kenosis. Everywhere. The whole, the whole palace had them over and over and over again along the top. Every staircase, everywhere had them. Why? What's so important about that shape? So a piece of research done in 1958, and it's just come out again in 2009, republished, that I think has just nailed it. The evil eye is one of the most ancient curses that ever has been. I could look at this gentleman in the front row and just glare at you, and you and your family and your city will be cursed. I didn't do that, of course. They lived in fear of the evil eye. The protection against the evil eye is a horned animal skull. The horned moon goddess was considered protection. From ancient times, Italians wore these horns as protection against the evil eye. Honey harvesting in Greece was done at night out of fear of the evil eye. The evil eye would whammy their honey harvest. You don't have a honey harvest, your society is not going to function very long. Horns of consecration are everywhere because they warded off the evil eye. That's why you have dancing goddesses on boats with beehives with their arms over their head. They're both a dancing goddess and at the same time warding off evil, curses, whammies, any misfortune that could cause the harvest of the honey not to happen. Shamanically, if anyone here has journeyed, when you journey shamanically, the horns, well first of all you'll probably encounter a power animal that has to do with a, a reindeer of some kind, that's quite frequent. These horns are one of the most ancient forms of protection in the shamanic world. But yet, somehow, the symbol of the horns, like many symbols, has morphed into our culture and we've kind of forgotten where it came from. How about this? And I'd like to add Nick Pope to this slide, who actually used this expression subtly in his presentation. Did anybody see that? Just a little bit of the... Uh, don't think we didn't see that, Nick. I've got my... Ah, charger falling apart here. So what this means, I don't know. I just find it very curious. I'd like to ask them, because that expression doesn't roll off my, my hand very easily. Another one sort of does, but that, one, that one's a bit more difficult. What is that about? So the warding off of evil, I believe, is what this symbol is about. So warding off of evil, mostly to protect the harvest of the honey. And here we have two lions, griffins, dogs, protecting the goddess. Puts the, uh, the context of the sphinx in slightly more plausible perspective, but here we have, as I mentioned, this dancing goddess with a fish on her dress. What is that about? There's a very ancient belief that to ward off the evil eye, you need wetness. You need to be wet. If you're dry, the evil eye is going to get you. So the fish and the other swimming sort of looking figures are a representation of, I'm protected, I'm the goddess, my bee har harvest will be protected. But we have a pillar in the upper left. Why is a pillar being protected? A pillar is an ermansol. An ermansol, in Old Saxon, means rising pillar. Many scholars have thought these pillars a lot of which are found in Germany, and that's where I went and investigated them, are the actual pillars of Hercules. And believe it or not, there's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that Atlantis 
was in the North. Germany, Finland. People argue that very, very effectively. If you read all the ancient texts, you can see why. Charlemagne thought they were extremely pagan and destroyed them. Here is me with one that's been preserved in a church. And what does it look like? Again, it's this sort of protection against the evil eye. Protection for what? The epic German poem from the 12th century says, On an Ehrmansel stands the enormous idol which they call their merchant. Merchant. That's interesting. But what does the oldest reference to an Ehrmansel say? It refers to it as a tree trunk erected in the open air. Thank you. What is that? That's a beehive. Here we have the place in Germany where the Ehrmansel was put inside of. So this round tower is where the Ermensal was kept. Here is Bill, <laughs> Bill Adi, and here is a beekeeper from 100 years ago, open air trunk, a tree trunk. This was used to either give the bee a home or to put the bee after you've caught them swarming or to stop them from swarming. These pillars that we find in the Iberian Peninsula, in Scotland, and in Ireland, scholars have told us they weren't fortresses, but yet they weren't used for storage. We don't know what they were used for. Ralph Ellis, the writer and researcher, actually was the first to uncover an old coin that showed what appeared to be a sacred tree in the tower. This isn't that coin, but this is just another one. Now, all of these towers, the ones I've been to, they're all by the coast. So if you're doing trade and there's something that you want that's being grown in this tower, wouldn't that be a perfect place for a beehive, for a bee harvest? And that's why the airman souls are there. They're anti-whammy, they're protection against the whammy for the bee harvest. That's what the round towers were for. So again, just to remind us how civilized and how advanced Crete was, I personally believe Crete and Thera were Atlantis. Atlantis had chariots, according to the ancient text. Chariots don't go back in the archaeological record much beyond 3,000, no way beyond 3,500 BC. So don't tell me 9,000 BC you had chariots. Elephants were in Atlantis. Crete had pygmy elephants. I think Crete was Atlantis, and they were their premier venerators of bees. Crete is also the home of the poppy princess, and this is part of my research that reveals to me that the economy that made the world's greatest seafarers so wealthy is that they were the drug lords of the Aegean and the ancient world. Poppies grow all over Crete. And here you can see a poppy goddess. She has poppies on her head. Poppies are all about sleep and death. They also produce opium and heroin. Very, very addictive drugs that are also really bitter that require a sweetener such as honey. So the Minoans had all these seals and signet rings that royalty and sort of powerful people would have. There's thousands of them. Here you can see a fantastic one of the bull leaping. Here you see another of a woman in a seven-tiered skirt. Keep in mind, the honeybee had seven, ab um, seven layers of its abdomen. For instance, if you look at the great snake goddess with a snake in each hand, she has seven-tiered dress alternating yellow and black. But let's, let's focus on, on this, this signet. She's holding a stick. This and these signets usually is accompanied by a drum, but not always. This is an ancient technique of stopping the bees from swarming 
by pounding the stick on the ground. Where are the bees? Those are beehives on the left. What's on the beehives? Protection against the evil eye. So the most sacred, sacred relics of this ancient culture, they're all about bees. Here's another. Wow, this must be extraterrestrials and some sort of, um, I don't know what. No, look at the towers with the trees coming out of them. A beekeeper looks at this and says, well, that's a really common technique. There's bees who have swarmed in the trees, so we bend the trees over to harvest them, and then we put the hives on the ground. Those round things on the ground are hives. And look at the boat. In the boat is a woman with that skirt again. That's not an altar. Those are beehives. Beehives on the boat because they are the drug lords of the Aegean. This is a representation of their own boat. They, they did a porcelain sort of representation of what the larger boat looks like, and it proves to us that they're transporting honey. So I'm not going to tell you that the Ark of the Covenant is a beehive, but in Acts of Ethiopia, they believe they have the Ark of the Covenant. And they say that the bee once defended the throne of God. And what is the throne of God? It's the Ark of the Covenant. And here you have Ra, who cries bees as tears, and Mahat is placing her wings over the Ark of the Covenant. When we look back on those boats they were dragging through the desert that Winkler drew, we saw and realized, I think for the first time, that those wooden boxes are hives. So there's a beehive in the upper right. There's an Egyptian chest with Anubis on it. Again, that shape in the ears and protection by an animal like a dog. And here you see Egyptians carrying these sort of chest. Well, these chests evolved into uh, canopic jars. Canopic jars where you put the organs of, of the royalty and the pharaoh for eternity, and they were put into a chest. What better symbolic place to put the organs of a pharaoh who expects to come back in the next life than in a beehive, something that symbolizes a beehive and represents complete regeneration. Remember I said there is no labyrinth with a bull, and somebody killed the bull, no, it's a fairy tale. Labrys is the term for the double axe. It's where the word labyrinth comes from. But look at these images of the double axe. Here's a double axe about to suckle a flower. Here's a double axe on top of a tower. Here's a, a pretty looking um, vase with a bunch of nice looking butterflies. No, they're, they're, they're double axes. Here's a double axe in the horns of a bull. Those same researchers in 1958 who suggested that the evil eye is what the horns of consecration are all about also believe, and I think they're right, that they're talking about bees. And if you think this is an exaggeration, look at this. In the time of Napoleon, everybody knew the fleur de lis was not a lily, it was a bee. Is that such a great stretch of the imagination? So, Kenosis, palace of the double axe, is actually palace of the bee. And why not? The whole culture is about bees. So one of the greatest relics from the whole Bronze Age is the Malia bee pendant. And nobody has any clue what it represents. Here it is here. We'll look at a big picture of it in a moment. And here you can see where the cemetery is on Crete near, near the ocean. Uh, I went there recently, um, and here you can see um, the sealed off section. The whole place is sealed off, and you're not allowed to uh, go near it, but I managed to get this picture. This is where the bee pendant was found. It's an altar. Why would you have an altar 
in a very small Minoan cemetery. Doesn't make any sense to me. So this is the, this is the famous bee pendant. Solid gold, dimensional. It's just regarded as one of the greatest works of art of all time. Explanations of it are, scholars say, two wasps. Oh, come on. There's no, nothing about wasps in the mythology. And plus, there's seven levels of the bee's ab abdomen. Wasps don't have that. This is what the museum says. It's a gold pin with a head the shape of a flower and two bees placing a drop of honey into a hive. That doesn't look like a hive to me. More astute observations are they're carrying a ball of pollen. Beekeepers recognize the texture of that ball as being pollen. And ironically, that the Cretan bees are the only ones to have been said to carry a small stone between their hind legs. Again, it's kind of making sense. Uh, professional beekeepers also recognize that the upper droplet is a special droplet of honey that's regurgitated and has special, special qualities. Others say it's a representation of the golden bees that nurtured Zeus back in the caves I showed you. And I think that's a really good, good explanation. I think both of these, the last two or three, really make sense to me. But what about the cage? Nobody ever talks about that cage. A wasp antenna? Don't, don't get me started. It's not a wasp antenna. A sign of kingship? I like that. Yeah, that's, that's creative. But folks, it's a poppy cage. Crete has an abundance of poppies. And this is what makes it so fantastic, because you have the bee with the eternal symbolism of life and regeneration, and the other symbol of the island, and the other ingredient in the drug, the concoction that they're shipping around the ancient world is opium, it's heroin, it's morphine. Many gods, well oh, many, there's seven Greek gods, Hercules is one of them, who went to the underworld and came back. Give me a breath. They were doing opium. They didn't go to the underworld and come back. It was a shamanic journey. And here's a picture of Demeter's son, Dionysus, who, by the way, takes the form of a bull, dies, and becomes a bee. But here's a picture of him with poppies on his head. So I, I have another potential theory for what the bee pendamalia could be, and it has to do with the fact that there's two bees, right? And we know that in Egypt, who's contemporaneous with this sort of 11th century BC civilization um, had bees in the cartouche of the kings and the kings were bee kings, right? So I'm curious about those two, the two bees. And here we have Malia, one king, Phaestos, another king, Kenosis, a third king, and they were all brothers. They were brothers. But the brother from Phaetos and the brother from Kenosis were really close, and they were regarded as the greatest, most just rulers of the ancient world. And when they died, they became the judges in Hades, the judges of souls in Hades. Why is that of any interest to us? This cemetery is directly due south, 68 kilometers, from where the greatest disaster in the natural world occurred. It was their colleagues, part of their civilization, up in Thera, where the thinking man, historian, would tell you, probably the best candidate for Atlantis. Not perfect, but it's the best plausible explanation, and I agree. No, I disagree. I think Crete is Atlantis. But never mind, why would you put a cemetery there? Well, we know now, with all that science can tell us, that the devastation of Thera took place over 25 years. There wasn't one earthquake and one tsunami. There were three of them. And like the Mayans, who knew that the natural world was turning against them and began to do sacrifices, human sacrifices, so did the lovely Minoans, sacrificing children in the palace 
women up in the mountain beyond the palace. And I feel making sacrifices, human sacrifices, in this so-called cemetery at that altar, right at the spot. And they're the greatest seafarers in the ancient world, so they know straight due north is where Poseidon, the earth shaker, is sending them these repeated, repeated devastations. First one hurts really bad. Second one wipes out all of their ability to sail the seas. Third one, game over. They're through. The Greeks and Mycenaeans will come in and take over. So I believe an alternative explanation is those two bees in the Malia bee pendant could be the two kings who are now in Hades. And this is interesting because you have these, these vessels for drinking, libations, the ritual pouring of a liquid as an offering to a god or a spirit in memory of those who have died. Well, that makes sense. You just lost all of your culture by two devastating tsunamis. Ancient Greek texts talk about the need for blood offering to Hades. This is where the gods who do the judgment in Hades are from. I think this could have been where they poured vessels of human blood as penitence. And then why they had all the anti-whammy, evil eye protection on this island. Because the island was being devastated. So the bee deities evolve, and, 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 and Zeus was a bee man, and there's a word for men who were bee men, and it uh, goes on and on and on. Uh, you can see these statues here, again, a bee goddess, bees all over her body, protected by two dogs again, interesting, always two dogs, or two griffins, or two lions protecting the bee goddess. And, and Eusephus, where the statue is from, its ancient Bronze Age name is bee, the coins they used had a bee on them, and on the back of the coin had an antler animal, a deer, with an irmansol on it. Again, the ancient world is absolutely spooked. Their world has been rocked by Poseidon, by the gods. They're asking, please, no more. Melissa, sacred bee in Greece, we've covered a lot of this, so I'll go through it quickly. There, it's very, very common. The Greeks referred to bee souls uh, who are unborn souls, and there's philosophers who thought that, that souls arrived on Earth in the form of bees. Perhaps that was the original swarm. Sacred bee in Greece, again, we, we've looked at some of this already. Oil without and honey within. That is what the centurions used to say. That the chaps who lived to be over 100 years old when asked, how could you do that? That's what they said. So here we have the second temple at Delphi. Guess what? It's built by bees. And Apollo appointed Pytha as chief oracle priestess, the Delphic bee. And in Greece, a high priestess used honey to indate, induce states of spiritual ecstasy. Now, about six or seven years ago, they discovered that there were gaseous fumes coming up in the rocks in Delphi, where the oracle stone, the greatest oracle in the ancient world, was placed. I like that. It kind of demystifies why the oracle stone is there. But even more recently, they discovered that the bees in Delphi uniquely have hallucinogenic honey. Look at the oracle stone. Does that look like the goddess Newt's dress? Does that look like crisscrossing bees? A bee in Egypt means bit. It carries the numer numerical value of 443, which is the same numerical value as meteorite. So, yes, the bee is related to the Ark of the Covenant. Guess what? It's also related to the Holy Grail. Because we're told the Holy Grail is a stone from heaven. What is a stone from heaven? It's a meteorite. The Oracle Stone at Delphi is conical shaped, just like today's beehive. And again, Rhea, goddess of fertility and generation, tricked her husband, who was eating children, by giving him a stone. And he ate the stone instead and saved the life of Zeus. 
There's a picture that depicts that mythology. So the Mycenae, who, again, they took over, and guess what? They took over for, for the Cretans, and they became instantly wealthy. I can't imagine why. Could they have inherited the drug trade? Their tombs, their tombs are all shaped like beehives. And this ancient beehive is seen all around the world. Ireland, Renmacheteau, Africa, everywhere, all of a sudden is commemorating beehives. Other mythologies, Indian mythology. When she started looking for it, it's there. A bee humming was emulated in the Vedic chant. So the noise of the bee is also esoteric. And we'll talk about that in some more, some more detail. The Mayan pantheon of gods includes no bee goddesses, only bee gods. And here you can see one that is referred to as the savior god. So we'll take a look at the early church. The Sumerians, I, I spoke to Zakara Sitchin right before he died. He was, um, he was not well, obviously, and I didn't have a chance to talk to him in the level of detail I wanted to. I met him before. I happen to think that the Sumerian beliefs that he has popularized as being representations of extraterrestrial contact are not extraterrestrial contact, they're bees. And the humans also have wings for the very first time as they're worshiping the bee. So I, I wonder if the bee is actually the inspiration for what we know as angels. The church and the bee, you can really cherry pick. There's so much out there. Go to Vatican City, go look at the statues of the popes, they're wearing beehives. Jesus Christ was referred to as the ethereal bee. Uh, bees, uh, the statue of Artemis, well, guess what? Her priests were called Essians or king bees. The book of Luke says that this is the first thing Christ ate after his resurrection. Honey is mentioned 61 times in the Bible. 16 of those refer to the land of milk and honey. And this is the land of milk and honey, Israel. And in 2010, they discovered a venerative bee factory, a thousand different hives. And this comes a hundred years after the bee factory on Crete is destroyed, really, or taken over by, by the Greeks. What's interesting is in the bee factory, if I can call it that, they found cult objects, including a four-horned altar adorned with figures of naked fertility goddesses, as well as an elaborately painted chalice. So this notion that there's drinks, these drinks are using opium and heroin and honey. The chap who brought us the tarot, the Frenchman, also talks about the Magi having a mead hallucinetic drink based in based in honey, of course. Church and the Bee continued. Again, you can cherry pick, there's so, many, so much of it. Bernard of Clairvaux is the first patron saint of bees, candle makers, later became a saint. Many popes chose the bee as their official emblem. Objects cast of beeswax have been discovered in the desert 3500 BC. John the Baptist survived in the desert on honey. On the anniversary, on his feast day in Wiltshire, a bee-shaped crop circle appeared just a few years ago. Serendipitous. The oldest poem in the Bible is the Song of Deborah. Deborah in Hebrew means bee. The Song of the Bee is the oldest poem in the Bible. She clearly is a war warrior princess, very much like a queen bee. Deborah carries the value, DBVRH does anyways, of 217, which has the same numerical value as hmm. And it's the sound that you hear in changes in consciousness. So alien abductions, near-death experiences, apparitions, everyone at Phantom, but no one reports buzzing, they report the sound of bees. Yoga. Again, uh, Wallace Budge, uh, the book in the bee, a book that talks about the duality of Christ. 
Uh, we go into old Europe. Uh, the chap who, who helped the, the victims in the Vietnam War was regarded as a hero because he used honey. In Russia, the beekeeping god is Zoism. That sounds familiar, right? Uh, Slovenia, they had these fancy paintings on the beehives. The bee in Great Britain, uh, beeswax in the, in the Thames, 3000 BC. And now we get into this tradition here in Scotland, England. Bees were said to make a buzzing sound at precisely midnight on Christmas Eve. In Wales, taxes were paid in honey. And there's a story of a bee being born out of a bull. The Tyrads in Ireland also talk about how prevalent honey was in their country. And in Tara, the ancient um, kingdom of, of Tara, they have an excavation called the House of Mead Circling. It's kind of like an ancient Guinness bar. I mean, it's everywhere. In, and here you see in the upper right, you see a swarm of bees in the shape of an airman soul in Wells Cathedral. And Wells Cathedral is right down the road from Glastonbury, which was the beekeeper's island. And Britain, of course, was the island of honey. France just is, is nuts. I mean, the king changes his coat of arms to be a beehive. They actually recognize that their country is a six-shaped country, which is what a honeycomb is. We've already covered the fact that all the philosophers, you can go Google it, they knew the floor de lee was not a lily, it was a bee, stylized. It gives new meaning to things that we would take for granted. Here's the dancers in, in, in Brittany wearing these beehive hats. During the French Revolution, of course, the beehive had a prominent role. Napoleon, what was his nickname? The bee. He's honoring the Merovingian kings, the long-haired kings of France who are supposedly descendants of Jesus Christ. Childric was found with 300 bees in his, his tomb to survive. Bees were all over the realm of Napoleon. And in France, the last grand master of the Priory of Sion has 11 bees on his family crest with two bears sort of protecting it or about to devour them. The organization that studies Dagobert, which is one of the great Merovingian kings tied to the Rennes Chateau mystery, has a bee in a honeycomb as a symbol, and there's loads of crest, family crest in France. So coming into modern day, the greatest ever secret society, the Illuminati, was launched on the 1st of May, 1776. That fact is Beltane, the day of Taurus, the bull, Labor Day, worker bees. The one thing that Adam Mishwapot really wrestled with is he didn't want to name it Illuminati. He wanted to name it something else, but somebody had already taken the name. He wanted to name the Illuminati bees. Freemasonry. Anyone who's a mason is going to recognize this concept of orderly, regular society. And, and, and that all comes from observing life in the hive. That's uh, George Washington, President George Washington's Masonic apron with the beehive in the, the upper center. Here you can see how, how beehives and the bee and, and the bee society becomes the foundation for politics. Communism is based upon it. And you can see here this cartoon, this British cartoon of how politics sort of emulates life in a hive. The uh, state buildings called the beehive in New Zealand. Um, Madeleine Albright, on one of her most famous visits, wears a bee as a brooch. Bee politics, bees as drones. I mean, all of a sudden, in the past hundred years, the bee is no longer deified, it becomes demonized. And, and here, it's inspiration for sort of these mindless human drones in the big cities just going about their business. Of course, Crowley wore a beehive hat, and now we have interesting folk tales that have survived, telling of the bees. When someone dies in your household, you're supposed to go tell the bees immediately, or they might swarm, they might leave. If you have a wedding, you're supposed to put a, uh, a piece of cake out in the back garden for the bees. You have birds and the bees. I mean, it's supposed to represent the sexual union of a man and a woman, but where does it come from? The only reference, the earliest reference to the birds and the bees is Cole Porter. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it, let's do it, let's fall in love. That's the first ever use of that phrase, but we know that bees are esoteric. Birds, they're supposed to have a language of the birds, 
So maybe birds and bees is just a representation of two very esoteric things, the union of which is very special, just like the union of man and woman sexually. We have, we have spelling bees, the orderly, regular competition for excellence. We have today traditions, you see this on the news every summer, where people compete, and it's a real honor to have the bees come and swarm on your person. Winnie the Pooh, this is very much an English story. Winnie was the bear who was taken back from Winnipeg to the London Zoo and adopted by a young boy whose father wrote the book, of course, and it just shows how the bear, of course, is the greatest natural enemy of honey, but it just reinforces how the notion of honey being sought after has, has kept, um, kept right through the ages. And many of our beverages still use honey, so, so nothing's changed there. The late, great Amy Winehouse and, and many of the girl groups before her have kept the tradition alive. Um, but again, we have these horrible bee movies. I was in a business meeting uh, this past summer, and I was with a chap who had come over from the States, and we were waiting uh, outside of the office of this executive, and just killing time, and there's a, there's a bee on the floor, and he just reaches out and stomps on it. And I'm like, why did you do that? Why did you kill the bee? And he's like, I was afraid it would swarm and bite me. Thank you. You know, that's what these movies have done. And if it wasn't for Jerry Seinfeld, there wouldn't be any levity at all. It's a classic bee movie with lines like, bees are only in it for the honey. My country is totally founded on the principle of the bee. Thomas Jefferson is writing massive treaties on the honey bee. Here we have the whole western region is called Deseret. What does Deseret mean? Honey bee. The Mormons who founded that region have bees and hives in all their symbolism today. A beehive was in the first flag. The coming to America of the Jardites is fascinating. Remember those boats going to the eastern desert carrying beehives? And no one's ever said they're carrying beehives before today. That is the ancient migration that's documented. The Jardites, the Mormons, came from the ancient world across ancient lands at the time of the Tower of Babel. They brought the bees to America. They had the word for bees called Deseret. Now, going back to, to Budge, he had a word for the red crown of Egypt that was called DSRT, and he actually describes it as Deshirt. Is it the same? Are we talking about the honeybee once again? So, just about my last slide. Does the America's capital hold the secrets of the real lost tradition? Washington's monument, this fantastic obelisk, the greatest monument in all the United States. And what does it say on the base of the monument? It says, to our Lord, the honeybee. How have we forgotten this? There has been prophecy of the bee's demise. Einstein is said, attributed to, that is, we've never found it in his writings, but he has said, and it's been attributed to him from a very long time ago, which is interesting, that when the bees die, man has four years left. The bees started to die in 2008, so that puts the end of the world at 2012, according to Einstein. Somebody who I respect greatly, Rudolf Steiner, absolute master esoteric, genius. He lectured extensively across Europe on bees. He understood them intimately. And about 80 or 90 years ago, he said 80 or 90 years from then, the bees would start to die because of the way that they changed the feeding of the queen bee. Now that scares me because he's, he's pretty much spot on. But let me tell you, there's no mystery of why the bees are dying. The bees are dying because there's one company in the world, B-A-Y-E-R, Bear big pharmaceutical, they produce the pesticides. No organic bees are dying. Who writes the report to Obama and the EPA saying whether or not pesticides are safe for bees? One guess. Bear. No mystery. The only question is, do they want the bees to die? Do they have sugar substitutes ready? armies of people to pollinate. 
I don't know. The conspiracy is every six weeks they wheel out a story about cell phones calling bees to, causing bees to die. We know that's absolute rubbish. So I'd like to think the bees will continue on. They must. Because for me, they represent the single greatest tradition in history. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.